Good morning, church. How are you? Hope you're doing well today. So what's interesting for us uh, as we have all entered in this pandemic is um, a lot of us are doing things that we've never done before, which is actually something that we often talk about uh, when we go to like places like retreats and camps is one of the things that makes them so effective is you get out of the normal routine. And so for us, like the whole world has suddenly gotten out of its normal routine. And so we find ourselves doing things that, like I said, we've been maybe thinking about doing for a long time, like maybe many people are making bread, uh, homemade bread for the first time in their families, um, or they started to write that book that they've been meaning to write for so long. Um, well, my brother actually uh, started to do something he's been thinking about doing for a long time, which is um, becoming what's called a professional streamer, which means that he plays video games and he streams the game he's playing on the internet and he talks about it and then people watch him. So as he's been doing this, I've been logging into his stream and watching him as he does it. And, you know, he has a few people who watch him every day, um, but then I got on the platform where he was and I started to kind of look around and see, you know, the other people that are doing this. And there's a lot of them. And some of them have literally thousands and thousands of people watching them every single time that they turn their stream on. And one of the things that I thought was really fascinating as I watched these different people is every single one of them talk about the community that they're in, that uh, the group of people that get together every day to watch these people stream are part of a community. And they just, they like literally just hammer on that constantly, community, 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 community. And I just thought that that was so interesting. And I thought like, we talk about community all the time too. And what it, what it, what it spoke to me was that it doesn't matter like where you're from, what your, what your uh, like social economic status is, what your language you speak, what time of the world you have lived in, time in history, all of us are constantly looking for community. And so the fact that we have found such a beautiful community here in Salinas and as part of Heart of Slants Church is, I feel like, such an amazing thing and something worth being so grateful for um, and something that we really want to um, invite others into. Amen. Um, so as we gather in our little community this morning uh, and we get ready for worship, let's pray and then uh, let's worship together. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for um, coming to earth and sending your son to earth, Lord, to die on the cross so that we could be uh, renewed and that we could have community with you in heaven for forever and with everyone else that we love, Lord. Um, and that follows you, Father God. Um, Lord, in this time as we worship together as a community, Lord, we just pray that your presence would be with us, that you would speak to us in the way uh, that you desire for us to hear this morning. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Let our shout be your anthem, 
give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great
so one of my friends had mentioned a couple of days ago uh, that he had been spending some time uh, reading, uh, really diving into uh, that famous section of scripture that we call Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. I thought to myself, why have I never done uh, an, an exclusively uh, taught just straight through, um, I don't know, study on that, teaching on that. I've always picked uh, things from it. <clears throat> I, I've taught from those little things in there that I've pulled, like topical issues uh, or, or sermons or topics, and then, or I've, I've also drilled down into maybe a certain part of scripture and gotten really, really deep in that, but I've, I've, I've never actually attempted a whole study from top to bottom or, or teaching top to bottom, and obviously we won't be able to do all of that uh, in, in this message, but uh, we will string a couple of uh, messages together because the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew covers three chapters. Uh, it covers Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. We will, of course, be starting in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 1, uh, and it goes through the Beatitudes. Jesus starts right off with that. <clears throat> but before we launch into this, I wanted to share some more context and some, some backdrop. Uh, first, it is super awesome how the Gospel of Matthew talks about Jesus. Not only does Matthew tie Jesus into the Old Testament uh, by giving lineage, uh, genealogies, he also segues into how Jesus actually fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. <clears throat> On top of that, Matthew wants to show how Jesus is the new Moses, or let's just say Moses 2.0. Like Moses, Jesus would come out of Egypt. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, it says this, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So like Moses, and the figurative baptism when God parted the Red Sea and allowed for him to pass through, Jesus would also pass through water by being baptized in the Jordan River and then enter into the wilderness for 40 days. Like Moses, Jesus would then climb a mountain to deliver his new teaching. New perspective on the kingdom where all are invited and all those that repent are welcomed into this kingdom. Jesus has not come to abolish the law of the Old Testament, but rather he himself is that fulfillment of the law through his life and teaching. Through his fulfillment, he will transform and grow the hearts of his people to love God and to love people. <clears throat> Having ended his fast for 40 days in the wilderness or the outskirts of the cities and towns, Jesus had started his public ministry. He starts in the town of Galilee. And according to scripture, news of who he was and what he was doing spread all over Syria, or basically that entire region. This translates into a heck of a lot of people following Jesus and his disciples around Galilee, and why not? Word spreads of his, charis his charisma and wisdom and power and love. People who are too sick to walk persuade 
<clears throat> persuade their friends and their relatives to carry them to Jesus. These cripples, uh, the, the demonized, the ill, the paralytics come to Jesus and he heals them and they follow him. So let's pick this up. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain, as Moses had done before him, and he sat down, as Jewish teachers of the day usually did, his, disciple, his disciples gathered around him. <clears throat> and he began to teach them, and this is where he opens up in what is called the Beatitudes. <clears throat> Jesus says this, blessed are the spiritually poor, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek and gentle, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the peacekeepers. They will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And blessed are you. Blessed are all of you when people persecute, persecute you or denigrate you, who, who, or who despise you, or tell lies about you on my account. But when this happens, rejoice, be glad. Remember that God's prophets have been persecuted in the past, and know that in heaven, you have a great reward. So we wanna stop there and just go over the context of what Matthew was, was writing uh, as he is recalling what Jesus was saying. Uh, I'm, I'm also going to be using uh, the New International Greek Testament Commentary. It's a very long phrase there. For reference, uh, because I feel like it gives a very holistic approach to these seven descriptions uh, that Jesus says on the mount. I mean, this is how he's starting it out. This sets, this sets the stage. The spiritually poor. So the poor in spirit will be those who sense the burden of their present impoverished state spiritually. Um, they, they see it in terms of the absence <clears throat> or lacking of God. Those who patiently bear in that state of longing, but long for God to act on their behalf, to act on their behalf, and decisively claim them again as his people. To people like this belongs the kingdom of heaven, which has now drawn near. Those who mourn. The time of painful loss will come to an end and the sense of loss will be transcended by the comfort of God. This, too, is part of the coming of the kingdom of God to the poor in spirit. The meek and gentle. Now, this certainly doesn't mean powerless, but in this case, an inability to forward one's own cause and in every case, God either is, does, will, may be expected to, or should come to the rescue. So maybe another way of seeing this is sharing in common the quality of lowliness, but with implied limitation of power. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness those who hunger and thirst, people who manifest an active desire, a capable action, a determined personal endeavor, with the imagery intending to imply that this is a chosen appetite, a focusing of interests and aspirations upon something like the seek first, one of my absolutely favorite verses 
in the Bible found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The merciful. Those who are merciful are kind to people in serious need. Their mercy is marked by generosity and by emotional identification with the situation of those trapped in their need. Mercy does not concern itself with the strict calculation of what others may deserve. It allows people to make a fresh start and often involves forgiveness and the release of others from their indebtedness. It is costly in a variety of ways. <clears throat> Those who are pure in heart. Purity of heart connotes integrity and stands opposed to deviousness. <laughs> there is purity of heart when the motives behind the mostly apparently good, but on occasion apparently bad actions can stand up under open examination. The heart locates the core of a person, that place from which we feel and think and determine our actions. It is so much easier to serve one's own interests by hiding behind a false front. One example that, I, that comes to my, my mind incredibly when, when we start talking about pure of heart is uh, my son, Gavin. So he, <laughs> he, he will do things uh, that maybe some, some people, uh, mostly his older sister, uh, would, would feel like he's doing on purpose to mean evil or to, uh, to, to maybe pick on or uh, abuse his, I don't know, his, his younger brother status, whatever that is, um, sometimes it can be seen as that. But when you really know Gavin, the intentions of his heart are truly pure, um, not to say that we should let him get away with everything. But most of what he does uh, is out of a very, very incredibly great and good heart. He wants to love people. He wants to love. He wants to be loved. Um, and sometimes uh, it, can, it can come off uh, a, a, a little different. Uh, but I always think of Gavin when I think of those who are pure in heart. Hopefully, he stays that way. Um, and next, we go on to the peacemakers. <clears throat> the action of a peacemaker implies a situation where peace is threatened or absent. The social or social political context is primarily in, in view. Peacemaking is a mode of response to hostility or other destabilizing activities. So not so much of an interaction, uh, sorry, not so much of an intervention as a third party, but rather peace-seeking ways of handling one's own individual or corporate situation. In Psalm 34, 14, it says, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. I want to conclude with verses 11 through 12. <clears throat> In verse 11, and blessed are you. <clears throat> Sorry, let me do that again. And blessed are you. Blessed are all of you when people persecute persecute you or denigrate you or despise you or tell lies about you <clears throat> on my account. But when this happens, rejoice, be glad. Remember that God's prophets have been persecuted in the past and know that in heaven you have a great reward. You take all of the Beatitudes, all of them, laid out in verses 1 through 12, and you get this. 
We are not, should not be motivated by a thirst for vengeance. As disciples, we have discovered the depth of our own personal need of mercy, seeking to be pure in heart and ready to suffer if need be, as those identified with the way of God. <clears throat> Throughout the Beatitudes place considerable emphasis on the troubles of the present time, but do not focus on the specific causes of these troubles. So in a broad sense, the background of scripture and history makes it possible, <clears throat> makes it possible to assume that a combination of foreign oppression and Israelite infidelity would have been prevalent at the time of the Sermon on the Mount. We must tap into God's mercy, his strength, his grace, his peace, his wind, his, his, windom, his wisdom, and his love. This must be what bands us together as one body. We must not let this current pandemic incite us to more distracted infidelity. As one body, let us stay focused on our Savior. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we are in need of your mercy every day. <laughs> I can already think of certain things that I've already done and I had, the day's not even over that have been uh, extremely foolish or selfish. Um, maybe even thoughts that I had that I, I didn't really catch as selfish at first. Um, and now looking back, I see that they might be. God, you have so much mercy on us. I would pray that we would also show that mercy to others and extend that same mercy to ourselves. Um, I'd pray that in the middle of this, this, this pandemic that we found, find ourselves in, um, it could be in the same situation. We, we could like it to be the same situation of you on that mount with all of that uh, political struggle in the midst of what Israel was in and, and just kind of how they missed the entire point. They missed the entire point of why you wanted relationship with them, with your creation. I would pray that we would strive to get that now. I would pray that when people see us as Christians, they would see you. They would not see raving, angry, and people that had no self-control, but people who know the end of the story. We know how it ends. We, we are attempting to be peacekeepers. So I'd pray that that is what we would do. We would be peacekeepers. We would be in prayer for our cities, our states, our countries, and those leaders that are in those specific points of decision. We pray that your wisdom would just cover them. God, you would be seen through this. You would be worshiped through this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi there, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm so encouraged and so excited to be part of a church family that is not only faithful in their giving when tomorrow seems promised, but we're a church family that is faithful in our giving when tomorrow seems unknown and when it's not convenient. So if you would like to give today, here are the ways. You can go to our website, harvestlands.org, Go to the Giving tab. You can text the word Harvestlands to the number 77977. 
You'll receive a text message and I'll give you instructions on how to give. You can also send a check to the Harvest Lands PO Box 2, Salinas, California 93902. If you are someone who may want to give a little extra, if I can suggest the Benevolence Fund. The Benevolence Fund will be used with the discretion of our financial counsel for those of us who maybe have lost our jobs or lost part of our income. And if you are that person, I please want to encourage you to email us at theharvestlands at gmail.com or call us at 831-757-3677. I love you guys. I hope you know you're not alone. And I hope this message today was encouraging and helps you point to Jesus and to reflect his love.